Okay, okay, I'm just going to read it then. Uh, verse 5, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today, God. We thank you that we can come here and we can open your word and that we can um, worship you, God. We think of, um, as the service progresses, as we sing your praises, as we listen to the message, God, please help, us, help it to um, just impact us, help it to change us, and help us throughout the week, help us to reflect on it and to uh, allow your word and um, your spirit to... Uh, make us more like your son, and we pray this all in your name. Amen. Can you all join us in standing as we sing praises to the only one worthy, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be the just, be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. Even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. Amen.
Father, thank you for this time that we can spend now. Thank you for what we've heard through the reading of your word, through the singing of the hymns, and now for what we will hear from your word. Spirit of God, I do pray that you would move in our midst this morning, help us to clearly see the text and for what it means. Lord, help us to apply it to our lives. And Lord, I pray above all that once again as we gather, that Christ would be magnified that Jesus would be honored, and that as we look to him, that our lives would truly be transformed. And so, Lord, I pray now that you would work in a great and mighty way. Oh, God, show yourself strong on our behalf. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Four- and five-year-olds are dismissed at this time. And as they're finding their way there, find your way, if you would, to James chapter 4, verse 11. James chapter 4, let's look together this morning at, at the whole text, verses 11 through 17 this morning. <clears throat> Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you? To judge another. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. We were in this text last week, and if you were paying attention at all last week, as I began the text, I simply said this, I have one point and only one point. And uh, that was true. The point was our talk. But if you were paying attention, that was the main point. Then there were subpoints, and then there were sub sub points. Okay? So just be aware, when I say I have one point, in my mind I do, but know that sub sub points are coming. Last week we talked about slander. It means to destroy someone's life or a relationship, to speak down to one another, or running each other down. And he's specifically speaking about the church life, but certainly our home life this morning. And let me just put a plug in for our growth groups. In our growth groups, we meet after Sunday morning throughout the week, and we recap the message. And when you preach a message like slander, there is so much to be said and so much that can't be said. 
that when you go to growth group, there were a couple questions last week that sort of went through all the nuances that were very helpful. So if you don't know what that is, you ought to know what that is and be a part of it. It's a great way during the week to apply this scripture to our lives. But James says, this slander, this speech, is evil speaking. It is judging a brother or sister, and not with righteous judgment, but it's evil judgment. And when I do this, I'm speaking evil of the law, and I'm judging the law. And so what happens when we, as a people in the church, use slander, we run people down, we speak evil of them, we destroy lives and uh, relationships, I then am no longer a doer of the law, but my disposition becomes the Lord over the law. And I step into a place now where I am God, and I decide that I'm above the commandments of God to love as my neighbor, and I become a judge knowing and believing, or, or believing that I know, the hearts and intents of the human heart. And James says, don't do that. To do God's law is a full-time job for each and every one of us. And this type of speech, this slander, is not an example of new life, but a pursuit, again, of our desires, our passions, and our idols. It is self-evalu... I don't know why I can't speak this morning. Self-elevating. It is pride. We need not live like this. In Church of Jesus Christ, when it comes to our speech... When it comes to slander, we need not and we must not live like this. This speech is more in line with what Paul said in Titus 3. Serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. That was our old life. That is the world. That's how they act. It ought not be that way in the church, especially when Paul continues and says, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, it changes everything. Listen, the gospel not only saves our soul, but the gospel should save our tongues and what we say. There should be a difference. There should be a change in our lives. And so last week we gave you several practical ste steps. Um, I hope that they stuck. I hope you applied some of these. Uh, close your pie hole was one. I hope you take that and did what you're supposed to do with that. To choose pleasure we talked last week about the conversation for the believer. True fellowship is our fellowship around the Father and the Son, and that fellowship produces joy among us to chase peace, which means to edify, to build up one another. And then finally we said to consider the person and work of Jesus Christ. And my friend, this is where we must always land. For every believer this morning, we don't move past the gospel, we continually go back to the gospel. And as Greg read this morning in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5-9, through 9, if transformation is not happening in our lives this morning, it's because, Paul says, that we are short-sighted even to blindness and we have forgotten that we were cleansed from our old sins. And so, we talked last week about slander. Now, verses 13-17, to 17, Paul, uh, James continues to challenge us on how our desires and passions can and will conflict with God's plans and desires for our life. Look, if you would, at verse number 13 this morning. We now move from talk, the slanderous talk that we're to avoid, and to actually correct, and now to our time. Verse 13, come now, you who say, and that means to listen up. If you are still pondering last week, and what he just said before about slander and our tongue, he says, okay, deal with it, but there's more to come now. Listen up, you who say, addressing the church. Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Now, it's important to understand, James is not here saying that we ought not make plans it's, it's not what he's talking about. It's impossible. God himself makes plans. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. God has a plan and a purpose for every one of our lives. As his child, he has a design for each of us. There's a plan. God does that. Jesus on this planet did the same thing. There was an evening he was healing the masses through late hours of the night, and the next day they congregate again. More people are coming 
And Peter says, hey, they're here. Let's start the work here. And Jesus says, no, I'm leaving. My plan is to go someplace else and preach and teach the gospel there as well. And so there's planning. God does it. Jesus does it. In Proverbs 20, verse 18, the, the writer of Proverbs says uh, that our plans are established by counsel and by wise counsel make war. And so James is not saying, hey, don't plan anything. Just fly by the seat of your pants. Do what you want to do. That's not the warning. There's something else happening in this text. It's important and imperative this morning that each of us, whether saved or lost this morning, get what James is saying. Look at verse 14. To those who say, I'm going to do this and that and the other thing. He says, whereas... You do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time, and then it vanishes away. James's problem is not with making plans. One of the problems he has is this, that there is no thought for us for me, for you, of our future passing. James says, we can live our life, our entire life, if we're not careful, without any thought of our future passing. He says, number one, there is uncertainty about tomorrow. You do not know about tomorrow. There are no guarantees. You can make your plans. You get all the ducks in the row. You can say, this is my program. This is the schedule. I've got it all figured out. But he says, you do not know about tomorrow. It is not a guarantee for anyone in this room. Years ago, a friend of mine was talking about a show he was watching. It was called The Final 24. And, and I, I've never watched it. I, I'm sure it's fine. But he talked about the premise of the show was taking the lives of celebrities who died tragically and going back 24 hours in that day before the event happened. And the one he told me about was, was John F. Kennedy Jr., 38 years old. And so they start to chronicle, 24 hours, he gets up, and his day is great. He's enjoying his family, going to wonderful restaurants. And as the hours tick down, little did he know that that morning, when he woke up, within 24 hours, the plane would crash. And at 38 years old, he would be gone. It's sobering, is it not? We sit here, and we live this life, and we think that we know what the future holds. And James says, you've got a problem. There is no thought about your future passing. There's the uncertainty of tomorrow. But not only that, we are unaware of the preciousness of the time we have now. Ben Franklin said this, Dost thou love life? then do not squander time, for that's the stuff that life is made of. Don't squander time, because that's the stuff that life is made of. And James says, our life is as a vapor, a vapor, a steam, smoke. We understand this. My dad smoked his entire life, started like when he was like, I don't know, I want to say five years old. I'm serious. From West Virginia, I think they did that. Right? Hey, here's a cigarette. Five years old. Smoke away. And he smoked until in his 70s when he had a triple bypass. But I don't know if all smokers do this, but he went through a stage of smoking a pipe because he thought that would be healthier for you and they smelled so good. And he would make these beautiful rings. Like Gandalf. Don't, don't even start. But all these circles would go, and you'd see them, and within seconds, they're gone. They vanish. And Jen, James says, our life is like a vapor. It's like a smoke, a steam. 
it vanishes away. Away. The root of that word vanish is to destroy completely. And in the passive tense, it means to be invisible or disappear. And so James says, hey, listen, there's no thought of your future passing, but you ought to know that this life we live, the life that's made up of time, it is precious and it is seeping away. It's seeping away. Listen, I am 55 years old. I know it surprises many of you. You thought I was 75. <laughs> but I remember now things from 30 and 40 years ago. I remember holding my firstborn, who will be 33 in June. Gregory, who was up here, holding him, will be 30 today, 30 years ago. I did not hold Andy like that. Um, he came later on in life. I held him in a headlock at the age of 13. <laughs> right? But, but you know how this goes. Life. You wake up someday and you think, where is it gone? Married for 38 years. Kids. Grandkids. And I know some of you young people, you think, man, school lasts forever. I know, yeah. <laughs> I know. I thought the same thing. Like, yeah. Yeah, it lasts forever. But I have to tell you something. It doesn't. And there will be a day you look back and long for the easy days of school before life became really, well, complicated. I'm saying, I know. I don't, I don't like school either. I'm glad it's over with. Um, <laughs> But long for being that age, maybe. No, not even that. Not that age. What I'm saying is it flies. It flies. And it's gone. And you wake up someday and you realize it's gone. It's over with. We live in a world that distracts us today. We have no thought of the preciousness of the time we have. We're distracted by entertainment. We're distracted by sports. We're distracted by mindless scrolling on a phone or a computer. And before we know it, hours are gone with nothing of value, nothing of eternal importance. And some of our culture, our young people, are living their lives like that today. We are distracted, distracted. There is something I know about each one of you here this morning. It might surprise you, but I do know it. Death is coming. In the second century, it probably happened before this, but when triumphant Roman generals would come back for their parade, as they were being lauded and praised for their victory, there was a slave positioned behind them in a chariot who as the applause was happening, would simply whisper in the general's ear, Memento Mori. Memento Mori. Remember, you must die. Sounds harsh, doesn't it? But it was to keep him grounded, knowing the applause of the world today will soon fade. And so will you. Our life is a vapor. It appears for a little time and then vanishes away. And this is, is the call of the church to prepare a people for their encounter with death. It is the one universal, inescapable commonality. Whether you're rich or poor, young or old, brilliant or an idiot this morning, you and I are going to die. And, and, and we can say if you don't know Jesus, that I don't care, I'm not afraid of death. And I used to hear people say that and think, well, you're lying, but I don't think they're lying. I think you have never considered it. You will not always be on this planet. You are a living soul. You will spend eternity in one of two places. And if you're the atheist who believes, I'm just going to die like a dog and that's it, it's over with. How do you handle death? Let me, let me share with you how one atheist handles death. Um, Alex Rosenberg wrote a book, The Atheist Guide to Reality 
enjoying life without illusion. And so he had a problem with death. And so he's trying to write a book to tell atheists who believe when you die, that's it, you cease to exist. Here's how to handle it. And at the end of his book, to sum it all up, here's what he says. Take Prozac until it kicks in. Good advice, right? Take Prozac until it kicks in. And what he's acknowledging is, this is a fearful thought. Our lives are passing. Eternity is calling. We're stepping off the planet. Death is coming for all of us. And if that was all we had to say, we of most men would be miserable this morning. But let me tell you something. Jesus Christ came so that we can drink the living water of Christ that he died and rose again from the tomb, which we will celebrate next week, but we ought to celebrate every day. That he said, I am the resurrection and the life. That Jesus says, drink of me and you will never die. And we have hope that goes beyond all of this. And we should be rejoicing that the greatest enemy that we will all face, the death that is coming, we can face it in confidence because there was one who went before us, who died the death we deserved, who paid the sin that we owed. And three days later, he got up. And he lives now for us and makes intercession. And because he lives, we shall live too. We should just go right to Easter this morning, man. We should live there. There's no thought of future planning. Listen to what Moses said in Psalm chapter 90, verse 12. And he's talking about the span of life for all of us. He says, So God, teach us to number our days that we might gain a heart of wisdom. Not number our years, number our days. James is at least concerned that there's no thought of our future passing. There should be. Young and old this morning, there should be. But number two, not only is there no thought of the future passing, there is no thought of our Father's plans. And this really is a problem. Look what he says now in verse 15. Instead, right, instead of saying, we will go, we will do, this is my plan, this is how I'm going to live, I got it all figured out, I'm going to pursue this in my life, Instead of saying that, believer, he says, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. If the Lord wills. And, and listen, I've done this my whole life, and it, there's nothing wrong with it, but if someone says something to me, I say, well, Lord willing, hey, we'll meet tomorrow, Lord willing, we'll go there, Lord willing, and that's wonderful, that's not a problem. But I think there's more here. I think what James is recognizing and pointing out that in our lives, we should live in such a way that it's, Lord, what is your will for me today in the limited time that I have on this planet? Too often, we make our plans surely based on my desires, my plans, without any thought of the Lord's will. As a matter of fact, for many of us this morning, we live our Christian life in such a way that our desires, my plans, my future, will trump whatever he wants for us. And this whole chapter, James is talking about the danger of my passion, my desires, my ways, my idols. And it's the same with this attitude. That, Lord, this is my plan for my life. This is what I'm going to do without any regard of what his plan might be for our life. And this is a problem for a number of areas. Number one, it's a problem because this is foolish in light of the time that we have. So do your own thing. Do it for a hundred years. But what's a hundred years in light of eternity? Our culture doesn't think like this. The church doesn't think like this. We think for the here and now, like our culture thinks for the here and now, like people with no hope, like this is the best life now. My friend, listen to me. Don't believe a lie that this is the best life now. If you're a believer, it is not. If you're, if you're lost, it's the best life you'll ever have because what's coming next is not the best life now. 
I don't care what any teacher tells you on television. That's not true. It's foolish in light of time. God, I want to know what your will is because someday as a believer, I will stand before you and I'll give an account for the gift that you've given me in my time, my talents, and my treasures. But not only is that a problem, it's also a problem because we're talking about a father who loves us. Too often in our lives, we view a surrendering to God's will on what he has for us as if somehow that's misery, God is this cosmic killjoy, if I do life his way, I will be just stuck in the mud, I'll be a sad face all the time, this really stinks, but I'm just going to endure. My friend, if that's your understanding of the God of heaven, who is a father who loves you, who is good, gracious, kind, long-suffering, patient, and full of joy, you have missed it, and you have believed the devil's lie that started from the very beginning, God's trying to keep you from something good. My friend, he is not. He is good, and his plan is good, and his way is good, and he knows what is good in your life. As a matter of fact, listen to what the psalmist says in Psalm 1611. This is not on there. He says about God, he says, you have shown me the path of life, of life. We live in a culture of death. This culture we live in is death. It's death. The MAID program, death. The confusion of gender, death. It's death. And this God says, the psalmist realizes it, you have shown me the path, the way, the life, which is true life. Believer, may I submit to you this morning that you have it all? You have it all. No matter where you find yourself, and I'm not saying that life is a bed of roses. We all know better. There's sadness, there's grief, there's sorrow, there's disappointments, there's pain, there's suffering. But in Christ Jesus this morning, no matter what happens on this earth, we have it all. He has shown us the path of life. In his presence is fullness. Not a tincture is in his presence is fullness of joy. My brother and sister, when's the last time you just sat in his presence and you meditated on him and who he is and what he's done and the journey of your life and where he's taken you and where he's delivered you from and just stopped and thought in his presence, no distraction, that joy the fullness of joy that cannot be explained comes over us. And then he says, at his pleasures, or I'm sorry, at his right hands are pleasures forevermore. This is our God, a father who loves us and cares for us and wants what's best for us. He knows the end from the beginning. He's created us. He knows how we thrive. So, look at verse 16. But, now you boast in your arrogance. I'm going to live my life, do my thing. We'll tack on Jesus if we need to. And James says, you're living now with arrogance, with pride. All such boasting is evil. It's evil. My brother and sister, this morning, we must stop running our lives by our own desires and plans. My dreams, my goals, mine. We hold on to this life of ours as if we can hold on to it, like a fistful of sand. If you tried that, it seeps through your grasp. You cannot do it. And yet we run our lives disregarding God, disregarding his plan, disregarding his program for our lives. It's like Eliot said, he is no fool to lose what he cannot gain in order to gain what he cannot lose. You get that? We are grasping for our plans, our dreams, our ways. This is what's going to make me happy. And we're, we're going to lose all that. And Elliot was right. He is no fool who gives and loses what he cannot keep, because you can't, to gain what we cannot lose. We must stop not consulting our loving Father, demanding that he placates to my dreams and my desires. Can I submit to you, you don't know what's best for your life. You don't. 
He does. And often we miss the glory and fulfillment of his plan that would bring us true joy and happiness. He has a plan and purpose for all of us. And maybe when we wake up in the morning, we should say, Lord, what's your will? What's your direction? And, and just a short, like, like, what was God's will for my life? Thank you for asking. He wants you to be holy, right? To be separate from sin. He wants you to flee immorality. He wants you to be thankful, to pray, to love, to communicate, to give, to show Jesus to a lost and dying world. And listen to me, you don't have to be a pastor to do that. We're all called to do that. The God of heaven, in his will and plan, has starts and stops for each of us. And so when you face a day without ever thinking about him, we miss the opportunity to be used by him. Because we don't know. There's a, uh, an illustration. Chuck Swindell wrote a book, an illustrated, uh, illustrated book years ago called The, the Tardy Ox Cart. And it's just a book of illustrations that he's used over his life. And, and the first, the, I don't know if it's the first, but the great story there is a story about the tardy ox cart. And here's how it goes. Um, it's a story about an old farmer and his son who several times a year would take their produce and they would take a long journey into the major city so they could make a living and be well. The problem was the kid just wanted to make money and the father was just enjoying life. And so on, on this particular morning they got up and the old ox and the old ox cart, the father's there, the son's there, and the son's saying, hey, listen, if we hurry up, I think it was a two-day journey, we can make it there early enough so we can set up our produce, we can make a profit, and then get home. And so he's driving this ox. He's just driving the ox. And the old man's saying, you just quit. The ox doesn't work like that. And the son's irritated. And so they go on the journey about an hour in. He, the old man wants to stop at his brother's house, who he doesn't see often. And the kid's furious, and he goes, and he spends a lot of time with them. They love each other. And they go on. The kid's huffing and puffing. And the whole story goes like this. Like, like one thing after the other, the old man is not in a hurry. His kid is in a hurry, and they have a number of stops in this process. It gets to the point that, that on the evening, there's beautiful scenery, so the father just says, we're stopping here. And the guy's like, we're going to miss this opportunity. And he sleeps the next morning. They get up about 8 in the morning, and um, somebody has a cart that's wrong, and goes and fixes that. And then they're almost there, and they see this bright flash across the sky, and um, it looks like a terrible storm. The, the clouds came up, and the son now is irritated at the father. The father's just doing life. And finally, that afternoon, they get to the top of the mountain range that would bring them down to the city. And to their utter horror, the city was no longer there. It was Hiroshima. Right? Don't know if it's true or not, but it's a great story. But you get the point? Starts and stops. There is an excitement about the Christian life when we quit living it for ourselves and our plans and our desires and our way and we say, okay, Lord, I'm yours. Take this ransom life of mine, this vapor, wherever you've placed me, whatever position you've given me, in this, and listen, quit with the secular and sacred with work. All of our work and all of our time is sacred. All of it. It's all sacred. We are a sacrifice for him. And so, there's an excitement of everyday appointments, of divine providence, of saying, Lord, no more my plans, no more my dreams, no more my, my manipulation, my getting my way. Today, Lord willing, what is it that you'd have me to do? Verse 17, therefore, to him who knows to you good and does not do it, to him it is sin, right? It's the sin of omission. I know this is right, but I do not do it. I've missed the mark. I broke the trust. I have crooked behavior as a child of God. So, hey, some bad news this morning. You now know. You have heard the words of James. What is your life? It's a vapor. It appears for a little time and then vanishes away. It's gone. You've heard it. Therefore, when you say, I will, and I'll do this, and we'll do that, and I'll make my plans, and this is my goal and my dreams, you ought to say, Lord willing, God, where is it that you would direct me? And without that, it's sin. And so we're here this morning to stir up one another and to revoke unto love and good works. So let me conclude this morning with just uh, three takeaways with subpoints. Okay? 
What do we do with this text? Number one, the first takeaway is our talk. Be aware of your speech. Be aware of your speech. And, and I think many of you last week, like me, were conscientious more than usual about what we're saying, to who we're saying it, and why we're saying it. May our speech as believers in this place and in our homes be edifying. May it build up the people around us and the people in our lives. And this goes for young and old. Teenagers can do this. Young people can do this. Old people can do this. All right? Your talk. A matter of fact, this might be a good exercise today on a Sunday. Maybe young people, when you go home, you can ask your mom and dad, Mom and dad, just curious, in light of the conversation at church today, what do you think the bulk of our conversation is about in our home? Young people, you ought to do that today. Go home and ask your parents, hey, mom and dad. The message was, eh, eh, eh. But the truth is, what is the bulk of our conversation in our house? Sports? Politics? Death and destruction? People? Or is there substance to it? Are we talking about Jesus? Some of you folks, you need to shut the TV off and maybe read a good book every now and then because your conversations are lame. They're, they're lame. They're, no, I'm, I'm, I know it's funny, but it's not. It, you're, it's lame. All you talk about is people and not to build them up. Could you imagine how your household would change if your home was known for edifying? Like each other? Like, hey, teenager, you can do this for your parents. Mom and dad, thank you for what you do. Mom and dad, yeah, keep on. You can say amen, parents. This is your chance. This is your chance to say hallelujah, glory to God. It's exactly right. Thank you. I know you work hard. I know it's not easy. I know I'm a jerk at times. I'm sorry. Right? I promise you, young people, this would change your home. It would change your home. Talk. Edify. So, number one, take this home. Be aware of your speech. Number two, be active in your time. Don't waste it. Francis Chan said this, Our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. Did you hear that? Given all this time to things that really don't matter. Really don't matter. Be active in your time. Young people, listen to me. Your life is passing. Be active in your time. Don't waste it. I was thinking this week, if I had, at 15, 16, 17, or younger, the opportunities our young people have on Friday nights and messages they hear and at camps they go to, to absorb all the word and the truth that you have, it would have changed my life. It would have absolutely changed my life. Don't waste your time. Be active. Take advantage of what you're hearing. And and it's not just hearing. It's then doing, applying the word to your life. We are wasting our time this morning if you're coming for a poem or a song or to be entertained and you leave here and do nothing. Then let's pack it up because it doesn't matter. Who cares what the sermon was like? If it's truth and you don't do it, we've wasted our time this morning. Young people, take advantage. Our single folks this morning, listen to me. You care about our culture. There's a blessing and a calling to singleness, and there's a blessing and calling to marriage. If you're single this morning and you desire to be married, and I'm talking about 12-year-olds, this is not for you, okay? (laughs) But if you have a desire to be married and you're single, then lay it before the Lord and put yourself out there. Don't be afraid. Go start having conversations with the opposite sex. And don't have conversations like, hi, I'd like to marry you. So don't, don't do that. You will scare them. So don't do that. But you actually could start a friendship. You could actually say, hey, I just want to get to know you. There's a, listen, we miss this. There is a beauty in friendships of the opposite sex. Like, hey, we're different. We can talk. We can have a good time. There's no, but so if, if you're single and you want to mingle, then do that. But if you're single and you're content, then Paul says, live out your life for Christ 
without distraction. Because there aren't as many distractions, and you can take advantage of that. You could serve Christ more faithfully without worrying about a husband or a wife or kids. There's a blessing to that. Be active in your time. To our senior saints, quit acting like you're useless and that you're done. You are not done. If you can be 105 years old and still coming to church, you're not done. <laughs> Mr. Cameron, God bless you. <laughs> our senior saints aren't done. I've got to tell you something. Some of our senior saints, they do more work than you can imagine, whether it's on their knees or helping people in this place. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating. I watch cleaning crews of 70-plus-year-olds, happy as can be to serve here, to be in a nursery, to be in prayer meeting, to take meals, to watch kids. Be active in your time. Parents, listen to me. Don't wish the time away. I, I had the, uh, the privilege to watch our grandchildren yesterday. Can I tell you something? I'm exhausted. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm tired, man. I don't, know, I don't know how moms and dads have energy. I don't. But sometimes we wish that time away don't do it. Stay in the moment. Realize there's coming a day they're going to walk an aisle. They're going to graduate. They're going to leave the house. Be present in the moment. Be active. And then if we have problems that have not been resolved, be active in our time to make relationships right. Some of you folks come from bad cloth. You've been cut from a bad cloth. Where there's, bitter, there's bitterness and resentment in your home. There's total dysfunction. And so you've been fighting for somebody for 20, 30 years. Why would you do that? Well, you don't know. Blah, blah, blah. I know, I know. I didn't ask about them. I asked about you. You're going to wait to the funeral to be sorry then? Make those things right. In your talk, be aware. In your time, be active. And then finally, in your tomorrows, be attuned. Be attuned. Man, God has a plan for you. It's a beautiful plan. Am I let go of my life and walk in step with the living Christ? I have no idea what he has for me, but it's exciting. That stop, that start, that conversation, that, that random prayer in my heart and mind that I, that I actually prayed for, a desire to go call someone or talk to someone. It's exciting stuff. You and I serve a living Christ who walked with me and talked with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. If that's the case, let him live out your life from your heart. And when we do, Lord willing, We'll be in step with what he has. And we will see him use us in great and powerful ways. That cannot be explained by our own passions and desires and my manipulating and my controlling. He will be glorified. and We will be used and be happier for it. Let's pray this morning. Father, thank you for this morning. I thank you for these dear people who, who are faithful. And they come and they listen and Lord, I, I just pray for all of us this morning that we would not just come and listen, but we would do, myself included, with my talk, with my time, and my tomorrows. May we hear the words of James echo through our hearts and our minds. And then, Lord, help us today to make adjustments, to make corrections, not to grab onto our life and hold it tightly, but to let it go, to, to trust you that you want to use it and you want to glorify Christ through us. What a privilege that is. And so, Father, speak to us now. If there's a need in our hearts this morning, may we make it right. Maybe it's a conversation. Maybe it's forgiveness. Maybe it's prayer. But, Lord, whatever it is, I pray that you'd work. In Jesus' name, amen. Join me in standing, if you would. We're going to sing, O Church Arise. And just so that you know, in our church, there's always someone near the front who will pray with you or for you. And that's open from the time we sing until the end. So take advantage of that as well this morning as we sing, O Church Arise.
hear his call today. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, today is the day of salvation. Someone can talk to you about that, share the gospel. But for those of us who know him, hear the call today. Give your life to him. Follow his will and watch him use you where he's placed you. God bless you for being here. Uh, coffee in the fellowship hall. Guests and friends, if you can meet us in the hub, that'd be awesome. You are dismissed. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Hey, you're dismissed, but there is worship practice.